out here is that he is a worship he one of our worship leaders. Not the, not to brag about what ha, um, about Louis, but what happened because of committing to fellowship. You see, there are other things that you can discover here. Well, if you don't know how to sing, don't force yourself to worship team, please. We have other ministries, which I'm going to explain later, or which I'm going to tell later. All right? So, don't run off. Now, in fellowship, we, we, we all have imperfect people. You see, we are not perfect. We sin less, but we are not uh, sinless. So don't run off if something disappoints you or, or you get your feelings hurt because this only demonstrates immaturity and places you in further danger of losing out with God. That's why in Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says, and let us consider, consider how may spur one another on Toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So we, we, we dare you to commit to fellowship. The next one that we are daring you to commit is to discipleship. Be a disciple. Be a follower of Jesus Christ. Disciples are not super Christians, Okay. They are not super Christians. They are called followers of Christ. They are more than converts though. Because they have moved beyond the profession of faith into a lifelong pursuit of following Jesus. Now some of us have come to view as, as this, discipleship as like an added or an extra activity for those who doesn't have time or for those who have time and interest. But you see, I believe that this should be a natural and intentional response to daily living with Jesus. Being disciple. Jesus said in Matthew 4.19, follow me. Right, right now, we can't follow him on the road, right? But it's just calling us to set apart. Set apart, challenge, and taught so we can adhere to the call and mission that he gave us. The word disciple literally means someone who pledges to be a learner. I am being discipled by Pastor Eugene, and I am discipling other people. It's like giving and receiving, you know, things about Jesus Christ. And it helps. It helps a lot. Whenever I have problems, I don't know how to answer it, I call Pastor Eugene. If he doesn't know, he calls the Lord. <laughs> but, you know, no, just kidding. But the thing here is that Accountability makes you sinless too. Believe it or not. And it develops your potential to what the Lord has called you to do. Let's say you already know your calling to be a teacher. And no one teaches you how to be a teacher. How will you know if you're a teacher, you, you're a great teacher or not? Someone has to teach you. So discipleship is more than a call. It is a lifestyle that should never be stopped. It is an instigation and flow for the Christian life. And it is our continual devotion, worship, learning, growth, and practice in Christ as Lord over all. And let us make sure... That our impact, the impact comes from, from the life transformed in us because of discipleship should be passed on to people around us. Of course, discipleship has a cost, but it's all worth it. A.W. Tozer said, The true follower of Christ will not ask, If I embrace this truth, what will it cost me? Rather, he will say, This is truth. God help me to walk in it. Let come what may. Here in our church, Cross Culture, we have our intense discipleship program called OSL. It looks like I'm selling Cross Culture, huh? But you know, this is what we do for people because we love God and we love you. All right? We have the OSL, which is called Operation Solid Lives, which promises a transformed life after. You have to go through level one to five. It is a very beautiful program. 
and we believe that it's spirit-filled and would really transform your lives. We also have our spiritual journey classes, which will happen soon. If you want to know more about the five E's, if you want to know more about the church, we are daring you to go to that class and learn from, and learn from it. The fourth commitment is if you want to experience significance, you commit to serve with others in ministry. Right? You commit to serve with others in ministry. Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. You see, many people have this misconception of being called by God. It's only something for pastors, for missionaries, for other church leaders' experience. But the Bible says everyone is called to serve God by serving others. I didn't start to preach the gospel here. I started as an ordinary Sunday attender. And then I, I, I went to, I, I, I committed myself to worship. I committed myself to fellowship and then discipleship. And then Pastor Eugene, who's my disciple, told, believed in me that, uh, okay, you can now go into ministry. Serve others. Because loving God and loving people, we are called to serve with others in ministry. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, even Jesus came here to serve others. Right? You weren't created to just to continue uh, or to consume resources to eat, to breathe the air, or whatever, to take up space. God designed you, listen to this, God designed you to make a difference with your life. You were created to add life on this earth, not just take from it. And God wants you to give something back. And that's why we want you to commit to serve with others in ministry. You wouldn't even know, maybe you are called one of those revivalists that would, would start the revival here in America. You would be even, you're, you, you don't even know that you're called to worship lead. Right? We are called for something. The Lord didn't brought you here just for, just for him to play with you. But you are called for something. Here in Cross Culture Church, again, I'm going to sell this one again. We have ministries where you can start serving. We, have, we need people for setup. We need people for uh, parking lot attendants. We need people for ushers. We need people to call people and uh, invite them again. No, we have a lot of, you can go to the hub and uh, ask for the info person there. And they will guide you through each one of them. Of course, in other ministries, we have to have qualifications. So let's say you want to worship, make sure you're not singing first. Okay? Now, we don't want out of tune people, but we, we look for the heart to praise God. Amen. Anyway, God has chosen us to do or to help one another. And I believe that we are the Lord's hands here on this earth with the mandate to serve his children. You believe that? You believe that we are his hands to serve others here on earth. Now once you're okay with, with the worship, fellowship, discipleship, and serving others in ministry, this one will be easy too. To make a difference, we must commit on mission. Matthew 28, 19 again says, Therefore, and go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Many people forget about two, three words. They just stop at therefore and go make disciples. But the Lord says, go and make disciples of all nations. Of course, it starts here. But going out to the nations is also, uh, is also a calling for us. 
This is a calling not just for, for the disciples, but for all of us. That we are to go and make disciples of all nations. That the gospel message must be delivered to the whole world. You see, we have to know that missions have most prominently contributed to the rapid spread of the Christian faith. It's not because of attending church, but because of people going out on missions that people know about Jesus and accepting Him as Jesus, as a personal Lord and Savior. Both numerically and geographically, I'm, I'm speaking about that. And when you do, when you go on a mission, you feel that you make a difference. And, and today I have the privilege of sharing the pulpit with my beautiful wife who will share something, a little bit of her experience in missions. Let me call my wife, you mean? Okay, good morning, church. So I just want to share that God has really blessed and given me the privilege that in the past five years, He has allowed me to go in four mission trips. And in, this, in these four mission trips, I have gone to the unreached, to the poor, and to the needy. In 2012, I went to the unreached people group of the Tinananon tribe of, in the island of Mindanao. If you know the Philippines, there are still 30 unreached people group there. And so one of them is the Tinananon tribe, and I was given the privilege to go there. These people have never heard about Jesus. And to have that opportunity to go there and preach the gospel and lead them to worshiping our Savior was truly such an honor. To see grown men, women, and children accept Jesus as their Savior, receiving His love, was one of the best things that I have ever seen in my life. And this opportunity really reminded me of that verse in Romans 10, 14 that says, How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So glory to God, you know, the gospel was preached and they responded and now there is a church that was, is built there and there's a pastor that was raised up there in that community. Glory to God. And in the same year, in 2012, I had the opportunity to go to the poor of Iloilo City with the missionaries of cross culture led by our own sister Nelly. You know, it was 10 days of medical and dental. It was tiring. Tiring. It was really tiring. But every day, we saw hundreds of people declaring Jesus is Lord over their lives. People were being ministered to and prayed for. And every day, we would wake up, get ready. And we were so excited because we knew that it was another opportunity to just show and tell them about our God. And then when, if you know when Typhoon Yolanda happened or Typhoon Haiyan happened in the Philippines, I went to two mission trips in response to that need. One was in Bantayan Cebu um, to bring joy to the children of the affected areas. We gave them clothes, blankets, towels, food, and much more. We gathered all the children, all of the children there, and threw them one big party. One big party. There, were, there was a clown, there were balloons, everything, the works, everything. Because we wanted them to feel that they are not forgotten and that they are precious in the eyes of our Father. And to see those smiles, seeing them happy, despite what they had to go through, was really rewarding. And the other one was, again, with the cross-culture missionaries to the affected areas of Iloilo, and that was in 2014, in February. Every day, we went to different areas, providing medical and dental. And we had to sleep in a hotel that had no electricity. Beds were as hard as the floor. Everything was, every night was so romantic. Because we had candlelight dinners every night. We had to wake up early in the morning because... I had to blow dry my hair. I was like waking up four in the morning just so I can blow dry my hair because there was limited amount of electricity. And we, when we went there, we went to these places. We prayed for people. We talked to them. And we just listened to what they had to go through because we knew that at that time, that was what they needed. 
That was what they needed. They needed a brother. They needed a sister who would listen to their pains and pray for them. And also, we offered them opportunities to receive Jesus, who we know is the only answer, the only way, and the only truth in life. And God touched their hearts. And again, we have seen hundreds of people receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, all these opportunities given by God to me personally are all in response to the Great Commission. And of course, in Hebrews 13, 16, that says, Don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. Because these are the sacrifices that please God. In simple acts like this, God is glorified. We become his hands, his feet. We become his representatives to these people. And through these short trips, they experience the love of God through men and women like us. And when we say yes, when we say yes to this call, we, we find our purpose in our lives. And yes, there are, there are inconveniences. There were moments that we had, like I said, we, ha we had to sleep on floors. I had to stay in places with no electricity. I even had to hike for hours uphill, carrying Bibles in my backpack with barely any supply of water under the scorching heat of the sun. But the joy of seeing these people know our Savior far outweighs them all. It makes every sacrifice worth it. And in Luke 10, verse 12, it says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, we often pray this, but I pray that we decide to become the answer to that prayer. Let us be the workers that go out into the vision field, into the harvest field. Because if you look around, it is ripe. It is ready. You can see the broken. You can see the needy. You can see orphans. So let us really be the people that says, here I am, Lord. Send me. Let us truly dare to commit to serve God in missions. Amen? Amen. I give glory to God. Great things he has done. Let me conclude this word by explaining just one. Um, I find it a requirement for all five to be successful. It's found in Acts 1.8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, the Lord wants us to have power. Power to understand who he is. Power to serve people. Power to go out onto the field to do missions. We can't just go out there without the power of the Holy Spirit. Why does he want us to have that? Because we will be witnesses. We will be witnesses to the ends of the earth. God's plan is that we get the Spirit before we get out into the ministry. The two go together. Ministry without the Spirit is a miserable job. Believe me on this. Ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit is a miserable job. It's like driving a car without gas. It won't really move you. Serving without power of the Holy Spirit will just make you feel good. But you will get tired sooner or later. And would even blame people, the church, or someone for what had happened. God's plan is that we get the Holy Spirit before we commit in all five of these areas. Every one of us is called to be minister. Someone who will be used by God to transform people's lives. We are called to do that, my friends. We are not just Sunday attender, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be an answered prayer to many people. You can be a miracle to many people.